I'm a selfish prick. I'm a cynical bastard. I'm a selfish bastard, and I, and I love that. Maybe he thinks if he says it enough, no one will believe it's true. But it is. And so is the fact he's a self-serving opportunist and an undisputed hypocrite of religion. But what does it matter, so long as he looks the part? Thrusting his hands in the pockets of his Levi's and assuming that tough guy demeanor. You know, the one he picked up from Chuck Norris on a show he used to write called Walker, Texas Ranger. And the one he assumed when resigning from a church, thereby getting himself a profile in The New Yorker. All of which is doubly ironic since the author of said profile never even knew Haggis was affiliated with that church until he resigned. Well, even more than that, and this pretty much word for word, when Haggis asks why the New Yorker wants to know about the Church of Scientology, the New Yorker replies, deadpan, telling it like it is. Well, no one knows who you are. We're only writing about you because of Scientology. And that's the true story of how Paul earned his latest moniker, the one that reads, Haggis the Apostate. It's the opening sequence of the whole Haggis melodrama. How he resigns because the church would not involve itself in political action vis-a-vis -vis gay marriages then under fire from California's Proposition 8. Of course, the church cannot legally involve itself in any political issue, and Haggis well knows it. He also well knows the church has no policy whatsoever on such issues and, in fact, welcomes everyone of any persuasion. But to fathom the depths of Haggis's hypocrisy, one has to ask, why didn't he resign from the Catholic Church in which he was raised and return the awards given him? Or for that matter, why is he still working with a Catholic priest on an orphanage for little kids in Haiti? But for the final twist of irony, one also has to consider what the critics were saying about his film Crash. Namely, that it only took an Oscar because certain members of the Academy weren't too comfortable casting a ballot for Brokeback Mountain. Hence, here is Haggis quitting the church over a bogus gay rights controversy, then keeping mum when it comes to the fact he essentially wrote an anti-gay backlash to grab his prized Oscar. But be that as it may, the fact remains Crash continually rides top 10 lists of the worst films to ever win Best Picture Oscars. The buddy in question is a D-list character actor and all around never was. He hadn't done a film in 10 years, but he does have one credit on his resume that talks to Paul Haggis. He's the poster child for the apostate cult Haggis recently joined. It's headed by a good old boy in Texas known as Kingpin Rathbone. Kingpin himself plays a starring role in the Haggis drama as Paul's guru and the mouthpiece who originally leaked the Haggis resignation letter all over the internet. Now, Haggis got cozy with Kingpin, knowing full well the cult leader wasn't all he cracked himself up to be, which is putting it mildly since the man is a certifiable nut, guilty of obstructing justice and given to fits of unmitigated violence. A little like what Haggis scripted into fight scenes for Million Dollar Baby. Meanwhile, the D-list actor beats up an officer of the court, is convicted of battery, and is presently serving a year's probation he's also under investigation for another assault, this time for hammering his own house guest. But seeing as the D-list actor is Kingpin's apostate poster child and resident celebrity, and seeing as Kingpin is also Paul's new guru, Haggis casts the actor as a cop in the next three days. The actor's performance is unanimously panned. Not that it matters, as the film pretty much vanished from theaters in less than three days, leaving Haggis with reviews like, he misplaces loud voices for drama. Nothing says I'm Paul Haggis as when he plays late night huckster of dental hygiene equipment. It's a consummate role and a defining moment in his latest writer-director outing. It stars an unwitting Russell Crowe, who Haggis scripts as pitchman for the 30-second smile electric toothbrush. 
It's a scene that's fraught with symbolism, which is the essence of true cinema. Three days, a 30-second smile. What does it all really mean? It means Paul Haggis was throwing another bone to an old pal. Because it just so happens Paul's old buddy, the mouthpiece of the fly-by-night toothbrush company and beneficiary of that Russell Crowe toothbrush scene, is a fellow apostate. All of which, by a turn of the wheel, brings us to the crux of the matter. Did Haggis tell Mr. Crow he pimped him out in the name of product placement for a cult buddy? And did that same said cult buddy pay a product placement fee? Well, for that matter, did Haggis even tell his producers he was hustling a toothbrush for a friend? The plot line revolves around Haggis as sensitive artiste, who, rumor has it, accepted five million bucks to script two films that went absolutely nowhere. When asked to at least make good on the payout by doctoring a few scripts in development, he delivers nothing. Because, after all, so what if he wrote a script everyone in town described as dreadful? That doesn't mean he's not a sensitive artiste to whom the whole world owes a living. Now, this one's kind of a road story. It's all about Haggis conniving a seat on a church-chartered humanitarian flight out of Haiti. It's another complex role, in as much as he's already resigned from the church when he boards the plane. But what the heck? He's been on the prowl for a photo op with orphans, and he needs a flight off the island pronto. Finally, there's Haggis as Lawrence Wright casts him in the 24,000 rambling words of a New Yorker profile. It's a role he might well have been born to play and allows him to stretch in all sorts of dramatic ways when explaining why he betrayed so many of his friends. He's indignant, he's angst-ridden, he's injured, and he's angry. Of course, it's all just another act, as is his reflective moment when he tries to earn a shred of credibility by recounting how he'd met the ecclesiastical leader of the Scientology religion casually once in 1988 a mere 20 years ago sure it's a flashback scene and a minor one at that but haggis plays it like it just happened yesterday it's also a fantasy sequence because the truth is, Haggis never met anyone of note that day. But that's not all she wrote for Paul Haggis, not by a long shot. Because just when you think he's played his last, here comes the denouement. It's the scene wherein all principal characters finally reveal themselves for what they are. Haggis, his apostate buddies, and the leader of their cult, Kingpin Rathbone. It's another filmic moment fraught with irony and deep significance. Because, sure, the alleged abuse Haggis rails against to the New Yorker's Lawrence Wright is the hallmark of his new cult leader, Kingpin Rathbone. And sure, Kingpin's another self-styled tough guy who talks from the side of his mouth in monosyllables. But even so, He's got himself a cult that's partly based on a self-published novelette wherein God appears as a handyman. And now, he's even got a bona fide miracle under his belt. Namely, he actually managed to get himself arrested for drunk and disorderly on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. That's right, the place where almost anything goes. But it was another what the heck moment because after all, how better to spend your wedding night than crying like a baby in the backseat of a squad car while they cart you off to county jail? Cut to Los Angeles, and it's the old tough guy, Kingpin, back in the passenger seat. This time, he takes out his frustrations on an innocent reporter. The first door slam might fall under the category of bullying, but the second, and then the third, that's proof he's still the same unhinged and sadistic psychotic he's always been. So no, Kingpin Rathbone may not have a lot of self-control and his cult, at best, counts only about a half dozen misfits. But all the same, as we fade to black and the credits roll, 
they at least now got Paul Haggis. Of course, you may be wondering why I would associate with such obvious lowlifes as Kingpin Rathbone, the D-list actor, and Mr. 30 Second Smile. Well, the truth is, we're all cut from the same cloth. Take, for example, the fact that Kingpin shoved a fist in his wife's face and later left her in the middle of the night without a word. He also nearly killed his best good buddy with his bare hands. But we've all had days like that, haven't we? Then again, that best good buddy abandoned his wife too. And the next time he saw her, he beat her up. But hey, that's nothing new. He's beaten up at least three other dames before. And when a reporter grilled him about one, he simply said he didn't recall the incident. Now that's thinking on your feet. And let's not forget my other new pal, the used furniture salesman. He admitted to a reign of physical abuse he and Kingpin Rathbone inflicted on fellow workers. And he's also got away with the ladies, <laughs> dragging his wife around by her hair, stealing her car, and leaving her without even saying goodbye. Then there's my pal who left in my old Alfa Romeo. Well, actually, his wife paid for it. And he likewise dumped her in the middle of the night, and likewise took the car, leaving her a pack of bills to pay too. But of course, none of this bothered me. You see, I've been known to get physical from time to time. I even attacked my own sister, and I'm not talking about when we were little kids. I also dumped my first wife and dragged her through a messy nine-year divorce and custody battle. Oh, and I almost forgot, while working with Lawrence Wright, I left my second wife too and gave her a New York apartment worth a pretty penny so she wouldn't say anything. You know, have to keep up my image. And then again, there's my new good friend, the D-list character actor. His misdemeanor battery rap didn't bother me in the least when I cast him as a cop in the next three days. Neither did his betrayal of those who had a hand in saving his life. The church staff members who, for nearly a month, spent 12-hour shifts providing comfort to the actor and his family while he was in intensive care, recovering from a severe car crash. The actor said it saved his life. It makes perfect sense that he now is betraying his former friends. After all, so am I. That's Paul Haggis and Friends. For his final monologue, he's yet again the classic tough guy speaking from the corner of his mouth and squinting as if facing a hundred miles of bad road. I knew I was going to hurt a lot of friends, he murmurs. Then raising his hands in mock surrender to his conscience. But you gotta do what you gotta do.